now talk to Sophia Warringer, who's Deputy Policy Director at the Centre for Social Justice. Good afternoon, Sophia. Good afternoon, David. Great to see you. Great to see you too. Well, I can't really start anywhere else other than the front pages this morning. We've got Keir Starmer talking the country down, saying it's going to take a decade to rebuild Britain. Also, the Prime Minister under pressure here about issuing this pass to Wahid Ali. I've got John Rental saying to me, oh, don't be ridiculous, David. This is a storm in a teacup. It doesn't matter. I tell you what, people around the country are thinking, hang on a minute. If you can pay £500,000 and you get a pass to number 10 and you can have your mates over and have some champagne in the garden, that's pretty good value for money. It does seem good value for money and I think it's going to cause the Prime Minister a lot of problems because this doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem that someone on a salary who is earning a good wage, you may say the Prime Minister should earn more, but, you know, that's a different conversation. He's earning a good wage, should be able to buy his own clothes. And the fact that he can't and the fact that it's a way for someone to get influence and not just influence, to walk the streets of Downing, uh, walk the, you know, the corridors of Downing Street, as it were, literally the corridors of power. And that doesn't feel fair at all because that is you know cash for access in the most literal terms and it's something that the Labour Party before they were in government criticised the then government when it was the Conservatives in power extensively for and yet now here they are doing almost exactly the same thing and they realise that governing is a lot harder than being in opposition. And that I think is it, that is the veracity of this, that's the truth of this, which is they haven't done this before. Now clearly he had an access all areas pass to Downing Street. He could have had a pass issued for the days that he was at number 10, that would be totally acceptable but it is very rare for anyone not formally employed as a political advisor or civil servant, civil servant to be given one of those passes I said this earlier, does it pass the sniff test? I don't think it does. I don't think it does, and it really is a huge privilege to be able to walk into Downing Street. And that is where the decisions of power are made, and often by the civil servants and the advisers that most people, even if they can get into Parliament, can't access. So this is a new level of privilege to be able to walk around Downing Street. And you're right, if he's there for meetings, if he's there for events, he absolutely should be able to get in. You know, members of the public are routinely welcomed into Downing Street. That's one of the great strengths of our democracy. It's not a closed off building, but it shouldn't be something that you can just put some cash down on the table for and then get a no questions asked pass into. Uh, and what about this, that he also gave money to Sue Gray's son constituency, Sue Gray's son Liam Conlon then gets elected again. I know that everyone in government and indeed in political parties knows each other. He's the godfather to Emily Thornbury's uh, child as well. But again, if you are saying we're a new government, uh, government we have new governance of this country and we're going to start afresh and it's going to be sleaze free this isn't the way you do it yeah i agree i think that is slightly different though people are entitled to give the money that they want to support the people that they would like to see into power you know there's strict regulations about how much money can be accepted and how it is declared and that is all in the public and that is well regulated but i think the problem is the access that is given then in uh, return for that donation people are very welcome to make their donations whether they know them or not or or they know their parents or are godparents etc all those networks are very tightly held i think in some ways there's not much you can do about that in westminster village is quite a small one it's natural for people to have relationships across different levels but i think the problem is the access that came with the cash that was stumped up now i don't know about you but i couldn't tell that he'd been given twenty thousand pounds for his clothes and there's a great article in the telegraph today for twenty thousand pounds starmer could have got more for his makeover i'd agree yeah maybe but i think he'd get criticized <laughs> too if he was too flashy we know the former prime minister well that's very Rishi true Sunak was so i think you can't win and i think he's going for that relatable dad down the pub vibe so he wants to go for high street brands he doesn't want to go for really flashy things and i think yeah he dresses well but that's not the most important thing and i think in some ways it's quite refreshing to see a man being criticized for what he wears it's usually the female <laughs> politicians that get this well apparently he his suits are about right because his trousers aren't too thin they're not too large uh, and apparently he goes to he buys a suit off the peg and then he goes to a tailor and has it just adjusted which makes him a bit more a man of the people, I suppose. Exactly, yeah. It's not quite the kind of 3,000 plus that the former Prime Minister Rishi Sunak He had very tight trousers. 
But that was his own money. He could have done whatever he wanted with that. I don't think we should criticise him. That was his own money. The difference here is this is money that someone else has given him. Um, and it, yeah, as we've said, it's a strange kind of setup that that then gets you access. But yeah, poor Akir in some ways. He can't win whatever he wears. Of course he can't. Of course he can't. Uh, let's move on and talk about the Conservative Party. I mentioned this yesterday for people who were listening to Breakfast yesterday. This was an article that was written in Conservative Post uh, by a chap called Dan Barker, who's a former Conservative Party member, a chair and PPC. And I just think he made a really good point because we've got the Conservative Party leadership campaign taking place and, of course, we've got the runners and riders and all of that. And it looks like Kemi Badnock is out in front at 24%, Tugan Hat at 18%, Cleverly third at 14 Jenrick 12%, Patella 11 and then Stride at 2%. But fundamentally, the issue, and I suppose what he's trying to get at in this article, is saying... Whilst they've embarked on choosing a new leader, have they actually had time to reflect and consider what it is that makes you a Conservative? How did you manage to be so careless to lose an 80-seat majority and get wiped out of government? That is the key question. How did we go from the 2019 result that brought together a new coalition of Conservative voters across incredibly vast social and economic strata and then get to where we are now kind of the worst result ever? That is the question that the Conservative Party needs to grapple with. However, I don't agree that they need to wait until they can answer that question before they choose the leader. I think they or, or, need or is to the question answered? First. Well, is, the question, is the, actually the question answered by who they vote for? To be honest, I don't think there's huge differences between all the candidates. So I think uh, they will be playing it to the middle. And then if they get elected, they will be moving towards where their kind of natural political inclinations lie. And I think the constraints of the MP cohort and also the membership of the party will mean that there will be no kind of real extremes amongst the contenders and who ends up as the party leader. I think it is too long even the current time frame because we will have we've had the whole summer basically no opposition things like the riots and then the unrest went by with not much scrutiny on the government um and then also we'll have a huge fiscal event of the budget before the announcement is made of the next conservative party leader yes it will have been whittled down by that point but there will be no really robust scrutiny supposedly rishi sunak will be the one who will be leading the party then but you know his heart is not in it and fair enough his heart is not in it i think you know he's been through the mill and he's got the result and the fact that he stuck around is admirable enough but it is too late to be still having this internal conversation when huge decisions about tax and spend which will set the future for this country for months or years to come are being made when there's no real strengthened opposition to scrutinise that budget in October. So I think the current timetable is still too long and I don't think reflection is necessarily going to bring results. I think what we need is a clear focus someone who will lead that and then the reflection can come internally but if all the reflection is done externally with everyone wading in and this kind of blue on blue attacks it just makes the Conservative Party look even weaker. And I think what we're going to see is a ramping up here of the campaigns and the rhetoric when parliamentary recess is over in a week or so. For your money, who do you favour? Who do you think is most likely to be able to bring all of these disparate elements back together? Because you, it's not one party, it's many parties. The Conservative Growth Group, the ERG, for example, the One Nation Tories, the more liberal Tories. And also, at the same time, you have to think about the threat that Nigel Farage and Reform UK pose, but equally the threat that other parties pose, the Lib Dems and Labour itself. I think you ask a really good question there, who can bring those factions together? And that is quite a different answer, in my opinion, to who can best take the fight to the Labour Party, which is obviously the job of the opposition leader. And I think in terms of unifying the party, I think characters like Robert Jenrick have a good standing. Um, they have been on that journey of starting out more as a kind of centrist Tory and then moving through his experience of the Home Office to the more kind of right of the party. He's not too tainted by previous um, governments. Obviously, he took positions, but he also resigned. But then that's mm. a different question of who can take the fight to the Labour Party. And I think if you ask the Labour Party who they are most worried about getting that position. I think they would say Kemi Badlinock. She's an incredibly effective communicator. She's very good on tackling what would be called woke issues and she doesn't bend into that kind of very identity driven politics which the Labour Party I think are pushing. So I think in some ways there's two very different 
asks of the next leader that are being set up. It's who can unite the party and who can win. And in fact, I don't think necessarily the same person is best placed to do both. But obviously, they will have to pick one. And of course, what they're going to do is whittle it down to four. There'll then be a beauty parade at conference for everyone to then see uh, how they set out their stalls. And then, of course, it then is whittled down again and then goes to two. And then it goes back to the members at that point. And this is, this is always going to be the issue because, of course, the members chose Liz Truss. Who do you think the members are going to favour more? Let's say, for example, we get down to Badenoch and Tugendhat. Who will they go with? Well, traditionally, the membership of the Conservative Party have been more to the right uh, than their elected representatives in the Parliamentary Conservative Party. So they tend to go to the candidate that can speak the best kind of rhetoric that leans towards the right of the party, particularly on immigration. That is a huge issue for the membership. So in that sense, if those were the final two, I do think Kemi would probably be the stronger candidate and um, appealing to the members there. But I think the members are also hopefully will have some reflection about their last choice, um, which obviously the last time they voted, they didn't vote in the kind of rushed election following Liz Truss's departure. They obviously voted for Liz Truss and they will have to understand that there is a difference between their ideal and who they think is the best to win over the party. And we're hoping that that will be a reflection that they may take. And I think it's important that whoever wins doesn't play into that really deep factionalism that could end the Conservative Party, let's be honest, they're in such kind of dire straits that there is a potential that they could whittle away, particularly if they really annoy the members. Let's not forget that it is the members that do the leaflet delivery, that do the door knocking, that do the canvassing. And if they just fade away because they're disgruntled, then the Conservative Party will really struggle and they need their activists to get the vote out next time they go to the polls. So it's important that that balance is struck. And there is one other fact here, which is they need desperately to appeal to younger voters as well. I think the average voter for the Conservative Party is in their late 50s, early 60s. So to encourage younger people over, they have to find a leader who has some sort of affinity with younger people. What we are seeing is uh, the number of young people, for example, going to Reform UK. Yeah, that is a huge phenomenon of the last election and something I think the Conservative Party needs to grapple with very strongly. It shows, actually, that the kind of natural adage of that you become more kind of right wing as you get older is not necessarily true because there are these members uh, that are going to so young people that are going to reform UK because they really care about issues like getting immigration under control about being able to be proud of their national um, history. And that's not something that is just um, a kind of pretense of the older generation. I think all the candidates actually are, are fairly young as politicians go. I think they can all speak well to the youth vote in terms of their own personal charisma, but they just need to make the policies that really matter to young people. House building is a huge one. The government have currently promised a huge mm house building agenda and the Conservative Party will need to match that and not be the NIMBYs and the party of the NIMBYs that always blocks and stops that. I think that is a big issue um, and I think the Conservative Party needs to look very closely at their policies and make difference of the, you know, make those kind of trade-offs I think before they've been always protecting things like the triple lock and things that pay well with pensioners but it may be a case of they have to kind of annoy some of their traditional voter base to get in some of the new voters. Sophia always good to talk to you thank you for your time Sophia Warringer there De Deputy Policy Director at the Centre for Social Justice. I'll